Scott Chu, thank you so much for coming to the Titans Nuclear Headquarters to talk about fusion. Thank you, Brett. It's been a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it's been so long since we first started talking. And I mean, listen, I, I know you're probably not going to brag about yourself, so I'm going to do it for you. <laughs> you are known as one of the world's leading experts, at least across all of the different fusion uh, types of technology. You've been in the lab system for a while and just everyone knows you, you know the whole space. And so we're gonna get into it today. But before we do, I wanna hear about your story, where this interest first came up for you. Yeah, so, well, when I was a kid, uh, you know, in the 70s, there was the oil crisis, right? And I, I still remember that in, in my mind as a young child and, uh, and I think I said this in maybe my ARPA e blog, but I remember my dad also having a very conscious uh, kind of energy efficiency ethos to him. So it was always, uh, you know, in 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 my mind, in the in the present. And but, where did you grow up? Uh, in California. In California, yeah, Los Angeles area. Okay. Yeah. So. So while I don't quite remember myself the long lines of the gas stations and stuff, I mean, energy was really uh, kind of always in my mind. And then when I, and I think the, the switch really flipped when I was, I think it was either early high school, somewhere around that time where I did a little book report research project on fusion. Um, and remember thinking, well, duh, you know, why, why don't we do this? Yeah, <laughs> it seems that early too. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, and so I've, I've had a interest in fusion ever since then. And, and then uh, it wasn't exactly obvious, you know, what you needed to study to work on fusion. And in fact, I really didn't honestly know that until I was in college. And I happened to learn, take a bunch of physics classes, all from plasma physicists at UCLA. Ooh, great. Yeah. And so that was almost just kind of, I happened to go to UCLA and there are a lot of plasma physicists as professors there. Um, and I ended up working, taking several classes and working in the lab of uh, Professor Francis Chen, uh, who is a very well-known and famous plasma physicist. He wrote kind of the uh, textbook uh, in the field. Now, um, fusion often seems like something that's very far off, but plasma, uh, which is a, a, a key state of physics that's involved in fusion is something that we use in products all the time and is very common throughout industry, uh, maybe even in light bulbs and stuff. So, so studying this aspect of the physics um, has real, real relevance, uh, you know, dating back decades. What were you, you know, when you say study plasma physics, what aspects of the plasma are you guys looking at? Yeah, well, so for, I think many people, myself included, um, go into plasma physics because of fusion. And in fact, the discipline of plasma physics was largely invented and developed because of the chase for to do fusion. Yeah. Um, but you're right; it 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 has a lot of different applications. You know, semiconductor processing and you know arc uh, handling of waste. I mean, it just it, it's a very broad. Uh, set of applications. And um, <laughs> just so we're all on the same page here, what actually is a plasma? Yes, so <laughs> plasma is a collection of charged particles um, because it has enough energy where the electrons are stripped off the, the, the nucleus, so forming a sea of electrons and ions. And it's, but it's more than just that. You need to strip enough of them off that the, the system now, the charged gas, has a, its own set of collective behavior that's governed by the electromagnetic field. Mm. Yeah. And do we think of this in terms of temperature at all? Yes, we can. Um, and typically you would need, say, m close to 10,000 degrees Kelvin or higher for things to be in the plasma state. But just because it's that hot, because sometimes it exists in a gas, doesn't mean that it's actually transferring that much heat necessarily to everything around. It's not like every time we have a plasma, things are just melting everywhere. That's right. It's because it's at such, usually they're at such low densities compared to, uh, you know, certainly compared to solids and, uh, and even compared to the air in this room. Yeah. Okay. So you got your taste of it uh, in undergrad and then you went off to get your PhD? Yes. So I decided, you know, fusion's a thing for me. And I went to pretty much what was certainly at the time and probably still is the, the top plasma physics program uh, in the country, if not the world. 
uh, Princeton. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And so when you first entered, did you have a um, an area that you wanted to focus on, a specialty? Or is it just like, get me to the best place and I'll figure it out from there? Yeah, it was a little bit of, of that. Um, but I, you know, I, I didn't know whether I wanted to, to do theory or experiment necessarily at the time. Uh, my advisor in college, Frank Chen, was like, you better do experiment. <laughs> <laughs> um, and no, but I, I definitely had a, I think early on I had a, a pretty big interest in pretty highfalutin, more theoretical aspects of, of say, fusion heating systems or how to heat uh, uh, fusion plasma. But as things progressed, um, uh, I, I think I saw like the big science nature of the leadership class work going on at mm. Princeton. And I mean, you know, don't get me wrong, it was fantastically exciting to see TFTR, which is a tokamak fusion test reactor. I mean, literally the year after I got there, uh, TFTR was on the front page of the New York Times. You know, Amazing. the world set the world record for the amount of fusion energy produced uh, in a fusion experiment. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and what what is that? Like, what kind of energy was produced at that time? It was, so at the time, uh, eventually, I think TFTR got to about 10 megawatts of thermal Whoa. energy production, power production. That's pretty sizable. Yeah. Um, and But this was probably only for an instant in Th time. That's right. A very short duration. And um, what actually, um, in that, so you said tokamak, what actually is being fused or was being fused in that experiment? So in there, they actually did use deuterium and tritium. Okay. Yeah. And so um, when we think about the various elements that can be fused together, I guess the, the idea is there's this certain level of energy that you have to overcome in order to force these two nuclei where they don't want to be and then release more energy. Um, and there are only a few candidates that are possible to, uh, is it that there are only a few candidates that are realistically possible or, um, have we proven mathematically that you can only use in a combination of the lightest elements to do so? Well, th so certainly the lightest ones are the, are the most accessible, right? I mean, uh, uh, a star of course will fuse things all the way up to iron. Right. Um, right. But but no, I think in terms of harnessing it for practical uses, um, it is kind of, you know, deuterium, 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 tritium, deuterium, helium-3, and people even talk about proton-boron-11. Um, but D DT is by far the, the lowest activation threshold, if you will. So that's the one that's used in all these experiments, um, yeah, at least in the tokamak version. Right, right. In fact, most experiments just use DD because you don't want to bring tritium into the fold until you're truly ready to, to do that. And that's because tritium is just more logistically complicated to deal with because of its weapons applications? Yeah, it's it's hard to come by because it has a 12-year half-life or, or so. Um, and um, yeah, and you have to, the handling of it, right? You can't let it get released into the atmosphere and in the environment. So there's just kind of more difficulties in dealing with it. Now, when you can't let it get released into the atmosphere, um, why is that? Why is, isn't tritium naturally occurring in the oceans also? Um, well, so in very, very minute quantities. The, the real reason I think it, it's a, it is a public, a, a mild public safety concern, um, but we have to take it seriously. So because tr tritium can form water molecules, right, can take the place of hydrogen, and so if that gets into water systems or, or into a person's body, then I mean, you don't want that. Mm. Uh, the, the, the legitimate dangers of it actually are not that severe, um, but nevertheless, um, we have to pay serious attention to preventing that from happening. I see. So um, where did you end up settling in your PhD? What was the area of focus? Yeah, so I ended up choosing to do a very fundamental uh, piece of plasma physics um, in an area called magnetic reconnection. Magnetic uh, on a, reconnection. Yeah, on a small lab experiment. And magnetic reconnection is actually a very ubiquitous process in, the, in any magnetized plasma. So plasmas will slosh around or have turbulence in them and or even non-turbulent plasmas. But basically, if, it, if magnetic fields are brought together in a way that they have opposing directions, mm -hmm. they will cancel each other. But the energy contained in the magnetic field will then get converted into plasma motion, kinetic energy or thermal mm -hmm. motion. And this happens in space plasmas, in, in extreme astrophysical environments, and in fusion plasmas. Mm -hmm. 
So in a way, and it, it, the details of it were, were not really well understood at the time. And even today, there's details not understood. But at the time, it, you know, the, in terms of a very direct measurements of what was going on in that layer as the fields cancel and, and annihilate, um, that was the problem we studied in, in detail in the lab experiment. Well, yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. Why... Um... Why can't we just do that? Why can't we just get the mag? Because isn't that um, isn't the electromagnetic force that is causing the repulsion that's so hard to to put these two uh, nucleuses of atoms together to begin with? If you just get them to cancel each other, um, wouldn't they just be able to stick together? Then what's hard about getting them to cancel? The magnetic field, you mean? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, it's not hard. It it happens whether you want it to or not. Mm. Actually, and and it does provide heating of the plasma and you can you can use that you know you can harness that in 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 good ways if you're clever yeah. in fact some of the fusion concepts rely on that they slam two plasmas together and the field cancels and it heats it up but yeah. but that alone is typically not enough to get you to where you really need to be for net gain fusion though is is the problem i see but it, it gives you a, a jump start though. it takes a lot of energy to slam those two together yeah it's not a matter of just like tweaking the magnetic fields and putting them in the same place. Right, right. I see. And it's important to state, I mean, even if you slam it together and you get an instantaneous impulsive heating, but then you have to maintain that heating for a certain duration at a certain fuel density for you to really have a chance at net gain fusion. That's the hard part. Got it. Okay, so you studied this. Yes. And then what became of it? Well, so we had some very good uh, scientific uh, results from it. Um, it was exciting. In fact, uh, one of the luminaries of the field, uh, Russell Colesward was his name. He, we were, uh, I still remember this very distinctly. Um, we were working in a lab on a Saturday and he comes wandering in and we were measuring the, the profile of the magnetic field across that layer like directly measuring it with probes and stuff. And we were like fitting different mathematical functions through it and trying to understand what that meant from a physics perspective. And he said, this is the most exciting result in plasma physics in 20 years. <laughs> That's amazing. You know, coming from Russell Colesward, right? Uh, oh <laughs> one of the God. one of the, kind of one of the fathers of plasma physics, uh, at least in my mind. Wow. That, so that must have been a good confidence boost to, for you to continue a career in the space. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, that that was uh, just a fortunate experience, you know. Uh, in in some ways, I kind of even knew then that it would probably be hard to top, at least from a scientific standpoint. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what happens next to you? Where do you end up going? Okay, so then I went to Caltech to do a P uh, to do a postdoc, mm -hmm. um, and I was drawn there again because it was a small experiment, um, and it was uh, on a alternate fusion concept called the SphereMac. SphereMac, what yeah. makes a SphereMac different than a tokamak? So a SphereMac is, is similar in some ways in that it's like a donut shaped magnetic configuration, but what's different about it is it doesn't have a solid center rod mm. um, and it, ha it, doesn't, it requires internal plasma dynamics to create uh, the, the field structure rather than um, these strong applied fields from toroidal field magnets. Yeah, how do you control what the profile of the magnetic field looks like if you don't have magnets on the inside to That's help right. you twist it? I mean, that, and that is the kind of the, the, the good and the bad of the sphere back, right? So you don't need to, you know, to, to force it to be the way, it, it naturally wants to be that way. It's kind of like a, a minimum energy state, we call it. But on the other hand, because of that, it also hasn't shown as good heat confinement properties as a tokamak because you're not able to kind of force it into the way you want it. But yet people still, uh, in fact, ARPA-E has a project uh, right now um, funding a project uh, on how to sustain the SphereMac uh, in such a way that it doesn't destroy the confinement properties. Wow, but tell me a little bit more about like what it's like. Okay, so now you've got your, your street cred, you got your PhD, um, you're over there doing your, your postdoc. What's a day-to-day -day like? Do they have, is it just a bunch of lab equipment, computers, people sitting around talking? Or do they, I mean, do they actually have a big sphere in a gymnasium-sized room somewhere? What, what's it like? Well, it spans a range. So at Caltech and, and even at Princeton, in fact, they were similar sized experiments, like it would fit in a large room. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think you described it just right. It's, you know, students, postdocs, um, 
you know, computers, labs, uh, and we would run experiments, we would take data, we would inter you know, do data analysis and uh, try to understand what we saw and write it up as a, as a scientific publication. Um, yeah, so that was much of my career, uh, all the way up to before coming to ARPA-E. Yeah, and then, but then you transferred, after your postdoc, you must have transferred to the National Lab System at some point yes. as well. Yeah, then I went to Los Alamos, Los where, Alamos. where I've, you know, 17 years as of now. <laughs> What's the story with Los Alamos? Los Alamos um, is known for uh, weapons development and testing, and I guess that's where they need fusion expertise too, right? Because yes. our, our hydrogen uh, weapons, the ones that are... Uh, more powerful than I guess the old ones. Um, these require this is like fusion inside of a fission mm, that's bomb or right. something. That's right. So Los Alamos is just staffed with scientists that I guess help predict the behavior of what, what might occur in these systems. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think you summed it up well there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean fusion is definitely a core competency of the of the stockpile program. Um, yeah, absolutely. And then um, I forgot, and if any of this is getting too much into the weapons -y side, you just let me know. But I am curious. At some point, we were allowed to do underground testing. Yes. And this is when we would we could actually then take our our theory and then take real measurements and figure out if, how good our theory was yes. applied. But then I guess at some point they stopped the underground testing. That's right. How did they? How do they know if what they're doing is right now? <laughs> that, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> so, you know, we are not allowed to do integrated tests of the full system. Uh, and we haven't since, you know, very early 90s. Why can't we? Why, if we dig a big hole, who cares if we just Well, so, I, you know, I, I'm not an expert on all the treaties and such, but there are international agreements, you know, that that we're trying to abide by, you yeah. know, and that that's really what's setting the, the rules here. Um, were you uh, were you were you there during the time before they switched over from I guess experimental to computational? No, or that came no, that came uh, well, my, yeah before I was a, an undergrad at the time. But certainly there are probably some good old stories from some of the older scientists oh, yes. that you worked with about what it was like. Oh, I mean, yes. that, to me, that would be like the most exciting thing ever to be able to well, conduct a test there, like that. There's <laughs> very few people left at this point. They're all either they're all kind of either just retired or well beyond retirement, and so it's at the labs. It's like a badge of honor if you actually designed and, and led a underground test. Um, unbelievable. Yeah. Okay, so um, at what point did you start getting involved in the RPE and the next generation of technologies? <clears throat> yeah, so that, so RPE, um, Pat McGrath at RPE uh, decided he wanted to formulate a fusion program in the 2013 timeframe. And it was very timely because at the time, there was also kind of a uh, winnowing down of of the breadth of things being studied uh, in the fusion program here in the, in the country. Why was there winnowing down? Well, it's a it's that's a very complex question. I think there were many pressures uh, coming from many directions. Um, you know, th their budgets are always tight, right? And so that was one pressure. But there was also maybe just differing opinions of you know should we. Should we really focus on the best performing system and really push on it as much as possible within the confines of our available budget? Or do we think that, no, we're, we shouldn't do that and we ought to still look at you know, more options? And so there was just, I think to this day, there's still a fundamental difference in opinion there. Wow. And um, was there, as things got windowed down, um, where there are certain ideas that have been explored even as early as, let's say, the 50s or the 60s that were just kind of put on the shelf somewhere, but like are still kind of really interesting concepts. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, I think, I think this was like the opportunity for us to kind of dust some of them off, I guess, or? Yeah, there, there's a whole range, okay? Some, I think, are, have le were legitimately kind of thought, okay, we've reached a performance limit there. Um, and either if, you know, either unless we learn some new physics or unless some new technology comes along to to break through, then maybe it's worth shelving. So mm -hmm. I think concepts like that existed. But there were also new concepts in the sense that maybe people had an idea of it in the earlier decades, but the scientific understanding of it wasn't developed good well enough, you know, until say even the 90s. 
yeah. or after. And so I think it runs a, a spectrum, you know, all the way from, yes, that one should stay on the shelf all the way to, hey, like in the middle, maybe these deserve another look given our new, new technologies or new computational understanding and tools to even legitimately new concepts that still bubble up every now and then. Do, is, who, is there anyone, any organization that maintains a really crisp catalog of every approach that's ever been considered and maybe just a, like a pros and a cons and on the cons list, maybe like a little note that says, okay, if computers become 10 times faster, this is feasible again. If magnets become 10 times stronger, this one is feasible again. If our understanding of gravity changes, this one becomes feasible. Right. Are there any, uh, is, is there a nice little catalog somewhere of all this? You know, no, the, traditionally there hasn't been, and, and that's a great point, but I think people are, rec many people out there who are fusion advocates recognize this limitation, this gap. I would gap. love that. I mean, there's. Yeah. Come on, there's got to only really be like a few thousand scientists, who, right, who like really yeah. know this stuff. We could probably call them all up and say, hey, yeah. here's the format, you know, just fill out this form and we've got... That's you know, right. <laughs> so there, there are people, there are at least a couple people I know of that are going down this road of okay. trying to compile the information. Um, you know, they're putting up websites, writing books. Um, I mean, all of this information is certainly buried in the annals of, you know, in dusty libraries. But that's such, what I'm right? afraid yeah. of. I'm afraid that, like, yeah. DuPont accidentally synthesizes some chemical with, like, superconductivity, but is, like, too expensive for, you know, whatever they make, you know, whatever they might make. But is perfect for this, but they don't put two and two together. And you know, like just, right, you know, right. I just want the information to connect. Yes. I think I think people, great minds think alike. There are people <laughs> on top of this now. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, and in the meantime, we have you, who pretty much knows everyone and all the approaches. Yeah, I, I know many of them. I wouldn't say all, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm definitely in as part of my ARPA E role, I've I have been going around to everyone pretty much. Yeah. Main fusion community as well as the out, you know, the bound the people on the fringes, just everyone, right? I'm talking to everybody and really trying to identify what are legitimate opportunities still. Yeah. Um, when RPE first got involved in this, back to that story, I think the pro was the program called Alpha. Was mm -hmm. that the first yes. um, time that they, and what was it? They put like 30 million bucks. Is that the general yes. allotment? 30 million bucks maybe find five or 10 uh, potential recipients of this money and let's see, you know, what's a task that can get them just a little bit further down the road. Is yes. that pretty much how these programs work? Yes, yes. Um, what are some of the interesting outcomes of that first alpha program? Yeah, no, that's a great, uh, great topic. Um, so as it turned out, alpha funded kind of three different areas. Um, one was just kind of integrated concepts, like the whole thing, right? They were literally trying to push performance of a fusion plasma. Um, there were three such projects funded. And one of them, I think, uh, really, really did make really tremendous progress just within the three or four years so far, uh, you know, for a really relatively small amounts of money, right? A few million dollars. Um, they it's were nothing to potentially revolutionize the energy sector as we know it. <laughs> yeah, and and they, and in fact, they uh, uh, are got um, an award in the Open Program, Open twenty eighteen RPE program. Open is another uh, bucket of money that RPE puts forward. That's not uh, necessarily geared towards uh, a specific set of technologies, but as described, is open to a wider pool. If you've got a good idea, yes. you throw it in open, you can potentially get some money. Right. Exactly. Yeah, so they are able to now continue their work because it's been promising. This is something called the stabilized Z-pinch. As mm -hmm. you may know, as other fusion aficionados know, Z-pinch was one of the earliest concepts ever studied. It's the simplest possible thing. Just drive a current through a plasma or a wire even, and it creates an electromagnetic force that pinches it. So this removes the need for uh, a more permanent magnet type right. setup and you're right. doing it almost just strictly with the physics of moving electricity. Yeah, so it just self pinches and if it goes well, well, boom, you get very dense, very high temperature cylinder, right? Yeah. But also one of the first things that plasma physicists learned is that the thing would go crazy unstable. Whoa. It would kink up or it would <laughs> sausage. I mean, these are literally the names of the instabilities, the kink and the sausage. Uh, <laughs> and it's very descriptive, right? It either winds itself up because it's lower energy state that way, yeah. or it kind of necks down in, in a certain periodic pattern. Wow. But in, in, in any case, it 
it thwarts your desire to pinch it down and and have it be, you know, hold it there long enough that you get useful fusion out of it. Mm. But now this group that that the Alpha program funded, and, and let me say, all these things were largely supported over many years or even decades by the DOE otherwise, right? But it was kind of supported as a scientific understanding type of project. Um, ARPA-E came around and was able to actually push its performance. Mm. So increasing current in this case, right? They were operating at like 50 kiloamps, studying the science of the how, how you stabilize the Z-pinch. And now ARPA-E comes along for a, f- you know, a few million dollars, is able to get them to go up to two or 300 kiloamps. Whoa. And it, there's a very strong scaling with the current because it pinches down like to a very strong power of the current. Do they want to go even higher? Yeah, they, they'd like to get up. So now we're funding them to get up to 600 kiloamps. Wow. Um, and if things go well, that's yeah. always the caveat in fusion, right? If things yeah. go well, that might be in the area where uh, what we call scientific break even, which is wow. the energy you put into the system um, compared to the fusion energy produced might now start to approach, you know, be similar. Wow. Um, are we... when? <sighs> As we like look at how these things move around, I, I'm still stuck on the sausage. Uh, are we learning new things about fundamental particles themselves, or even like physics itself? Um, no, probably not at that fundamental level, for the most part, right? Plasma physics is, um, you know, it, it's it's classic, classical electromagnetic physics for the most part. It's it's just a very complicated N-body system, if you will. Mm. What does um, N-body mean? Just that, um, you know, you have, I mean, in a plasma, literally, you have 10 to the 20 or more individual charged particles flying around, right? And yeah. so you can't, even with our powerful computers today, you can't possibly follow every one of them around um, for a meaningful experiment, right? I mean, you can actually do that for a very short duration and for a very small part of your experiment, but not the whole thing. Yeah. So yeah, it's just, you, you just can't predictively calculate what's gonna happen. That's where the complexity comes from. So Z-Pinch is a great example of how um, simple concept, been around for a while, maybe the research kind of got stuck a little bit somewhere along the way, but you give it a new burst of life, maybe some new, you know, put some new heads on the matter, and all of a sudden um, we can see uh, great strides of progress in just a short period of time, relatively short period of time and relatively a little bit about a uh, bit of money. Are we hoping that there are other avenues um, that we can apply that same um, process to? Uh, just juice up the enthusiasm a little bit, put a few new thinkers on it, give them a little bit of money, and we can also see you know big steps towards this, this break-even goal? Yeah, I'd like to think the answer is yes, right? But I think it'd be helpful I'd like to be systematic about it, right? And so you you try to identify, okay, is it is it like a legitimate physics understanding, like in the case of the stabilized Z pinch? And I didn't even get to explain that was like this sheared flow. So if the flow in your Z pinch is faster in the middle and slower on the outside, or vice versa, it's just that the difference in flow actually stabilizes the kink in the sausage. Mm-hmm. That's the piece of physics that was learned over the last 20 years or so, but it was never harnessed to push the performance of it. So that was a clear opportunity, right? Yeah. Um, but there are other opportunities. Uh, you know, let's say, I'd uh, like another example is a concept that was called Linus because NRL, Naval Research Lab, studied this way back in the late 70s. And this was actually General Fusion, the private fusion company, uh, has a lot of its inspiration from the Linus concept, Mm -hmm. which is this spinning liquid metal that then also compresses a plasma to fusion conditions. Wow. And at the time, back in the late 70s and even 80s and 90s, you you just, there were two problems. One is you couldn't really... um, they, they could create the spinning and, and um, imploding liquid metal, but they probably couldn't do it quite fast enough and, and with enough precision um, and also to mate it with a plasma inside that kind of match time scales, right? Like you could implode it at a certain speed, but the plasma would die in that same time. 
and that doesn't do you any good. But fast forward 20, 30 years, um, and this is what General Fusion will, will you know, try to convince you of, is now we, with advanced, advanced electronics understanding and, and trying to power the implosion and improve plasma physics understanding to get the right plasma inside to do the compression, well, now it's worth taking another look again at that concept. Yes. So that's another example where both the physics and the engineering uh, technology have come have been advanced enough that it's worth taking another look. Do we, when taking a look at these fusion systems, do we look at them from the business perspective as well as the physics perspective and say, you know what, even you know, for some of these uh, approaches, we, uh, we all think that it might be, phys you know, from a physics perspective, it might be possible. From a technology perspective, it's likely to happen at some point. But if we look at it from a business perspective and we see, okay, all of the extra equipment that would be necessary, you know, these computers, maybe uh, um, metals, you know, precious metals that, uh, you know, are very expensive. Uh, do we ever run that business analysis where we just look at the whole system and say, we're assuming the technology works, but uh, let's run the math on the whole thing just in case it's, then it's still more expensive than coal at the end of the day. Yes. Um, d definitely. So through the years, there have been government-sponsored reactor studies, costing studies. Uh, those are called ARIES. There's a, they did a whole series of studies. Um, the private companies all do that to some extent. Um, they don't necessarily make the details of their costing studies public, but they do have something in mind. At ARPA-E, we definitely pay attention to that. Yeah. And in fact, that drives the metrics in our programs. We recognize, um, yeah, I mean, you can't be too far off of, of projected energy systems, right? I mean, it's kind of funny. I try to argue the fusion people down in cost, and I try to argue people at ARPA-E and other energy advocates a little bit up in cost, right? Because, you know, if you, it's not a fair comparison just to pit fusion or nuclear, as you well know, just against our cheapest natural gas today, right? Because they, yeah. they provide different benefits. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a hard question. But, but it's super hard. Yeah. Um, are there other aspects that we, we should be considering as well? Let's say we assume, you know, for any given approach, we assume the technology works out. One of, one of the ones that I've uh, been kind of rattling around in my head are, is like a neutronic versus neutronic mm -hmm. uh, fission and the per, per, uh, potential proliferation concerns with neutronic. If you have all these extra neutrons, um, then perhaps, um, well, neutrons can be used for dangerous things. Uh, you know, you could convert U-238 into plutonium-239 uh, relatively cost-effectively if you had a ton of extra neutrons that were easily accessible from any device. Do we also look at those concerns? Uh, once again, assuming the physics works out, assuming the technology yes. works out. Uh, there are people who think about that. Um, I, I think maybe not enough to this point. Mm. Um, I, I think in the in the nuclear energy space as well, potentially. And that's actually an area of interest for me personally. Yeah. Uh, in fact, after I get fusion programs launched, I might, if I still have time remaining at RPE, I might take a look at that. So yeah, tell um, me, what are your thoughts on on that subject? Um, so there are different. There's a key difference between fusion and fission, which is on a in, on a fusion power plant, you should not have any fissile materials present. Period, and that's already a very binary advantage, right? And in fact, people who study this from an academic perspective would make the argument that this this makes your detection challenge much easier because you shouldn't have any fissile material on site. Period, yeah. right? Whereas on a fission plant, well, of course you have fissile material yeah. on site. What? That's your fuel. Yeah. Uh, and so it makes clandestine activities perhaps a little bit easier to, to get away with. But that's not the whole story. I, I think, uh, like you said, if you have energetic neutrons, it's always a concern. Um, the people who advocate for micro reactor class sized concepts, you know, I, I think this is an area that maybe hasn't been questioned enough that. You know, you, you don't necessarily want a gazillion micro reactors running around the world, right? How do you keep track of them? Same with uh, fission too? No, right. Yeah. So I, I think those are real concerns and we have to, we have to study that yeah. harder. 
what are some um, what are some of the other approaches that uh, look promising? So we mentioned the Z pinch. Uh, you, you brought up the uh, the spinning uh, metallic fluid for uh, general fusion. That's taking another look at. What are some other exciting new prospects right now? Yeah, so I, I think al you know alpha focused in general on the class of magnetized pulsed concepts. Mm. I do, and we call this a magneto inertial fusion. Okay. Uh, and that actually has been known for a long time, but there hasn't really been a coherent program to push it. Uh, although at Sandia National Lab, their main approach now is, is based on this idea of imploding concepts with a magnetic field. Mm. Um, so I still think there's a lot of upside there, uh, which is why I remain interested in that whole area. Yeah. Um, I do think, especially with the role of ARPA E in the in the um, energy funding ecosystem, you know, we're tasked with higher risk, higher reward approaches. Yeah. So I think going back to look at looking at more fundamental ways of making fusion more attractive, whether it's through advanced fuels and reducing the energetic neutron production, or maybe even in finding legitimate ways to control the fusion cross section. Um, Tell me more about that. That sounds exciting. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I, I, at the risk of bringing up the cold fusion word. Bring it up, bring it up, uh, bring it up. But I think there remains opportunity to looking at this from a, you know, a rigorous scientific approach of understanding um, the fusion cross-section itself. And there is evidence out there, you know, that in a condensed matter environment that you can affect the nuclear fusion cross-section. Okay, so I know about a fission cross-section, um, and I'm gonna try to describe it right now. You can, you're better at this than me, so you can correct me on the fission. Then I'm gonna ask you to help me understand what yes. that means in terms of fusion. As I understand the fission cross-section, it's kind of like a, a probability distribution that you know your neutron is gonna hit what you want it to hit. Mm -hmm. um, and at different temperatures, that probability looks a little bit different. And so that's why we always talk about you know, thermalized neutrons. Thermal means, you know, they're, they're operating at lower speeds, right. uh, which increases the likelihood um, that you're going to hit uh, another uh, nucleus of, an, of another atom. And then to make things even more complicated, not only do you have different profiles um, at different temperatures, but every element has its own cross-section. And you can just look these up in a table and be like, okay, this one is a lot more likely relative to this one to... And I think there's even two types of cross sections in fission. You got your your scattering, and you got your absorption. So where the neutron will uh, hit into it and stick with it, or whether it'll bounce off, or or even you know mm -hmm. split it. Mm -hmm. So you got these. Uh, so it's, uh, so cross section. I just think of like probability. Something yes. That's yes. Gonna happen. How does that work? In it's almost exactly the same. So in you know, let's take the DT reaction for example. So um, there's a D. Again, it, it, it's an ion, right? Because it's at usually it's at an energy maybe that the electron stripped off, and there's a Coulomb barrier, right? The, if it's positively charged and positively charged, they they want to repel repel each other. Yeah. And so when you have two bare hydrogen add ions or isotopes, you have to slam them with enough energy that they get close enough that the there's a quantum tunneling probability mm. such that they will actually fuse, right? It, you have to get it close enough such that that probability becomes big enough. Yeah. Um, and, and, and again, the cross-section is kind of a, it's an area, it's an effective area that tells you, you know, what probability at which area, you know, that it will then join and fuse. Um. So it's almost like the nucleus of every atom is is two counteracting uh, forces. You've got your electromagnetic, and since there's a bunch of positively charged protons on the inside, they don't want to be near each other. Right. And they don't want to be near the protons of other atoms either. And so that's what keeps everything apart. But then, you know, you got a lot of protons that are really close to each other. Um, and those are kind of glued together uh, by the neutrons because there's another force the strong force that uh, if you're a proton or a neutron, um, it really wants them to hug each other. Right. Uh, it, it's like um, it's almost like a, a spring that wants to push out, 
versus a vice clamp that's that's keeping something right. together. And that's the the inside of uh, inside the of the nucleus. Yeah. Inside of the, the nucleus. Let me ask. <laughs> Maybe this is just my visualization problem. If you've got uh, an isotope of an element that has a lot more neutrons than protons, and so it's almost like the outer surface of the nucleus is covered in neutrons, how come you can't just put it to another element or another isotope that also just has like a nice coating on the outside of neutrons, and then you, you just physically get them close enough so the neutron and the neutron want to hold each other and they're already pretty good at holding all the protons together is that possible okay well so let me just say i'm not a nuclear physicist but <laughs> but it's it's not the neutrons that are that are uh keeping those things together it, oh. it's actually another subatomic particle called a gluon a gluon right so and, and this is quark land yeah this is su subatomic <laughs> <laughs> physics right um so i think what you were describing is is, is not actually the the picture of what's happening i okay, mean yeah, if you, correct me. yeah if you have two nuclei close together um i mean they will still well if it's neutrals right if they're just neutral atoms you know then then they there's no electromagnetic repulsion yeah but it, it would just maybe be like a gas or whatever oh, they or, won't stick to each other right oh. um but if they're in a solid Right then, there's a lattice holding things together through chemical bonds and, and such. Right, and and I think uh, back to the fusion cross section um, uh, story we were just talking about. Yeah. The understanding of nuclear fusion cross so cross sections have largely been developed in kind of high energy two body picture. Right, like slamming individual particles together, and then and then you can um, predict. The probability of when they fuse based on the Coulomb potential and the quantum tunneling. Okay. And, and you say high energy. Yeah. And so that's the hot as opposed that, to the cold. That's right. That's okay. the hot thermonuclear fusion that that most of us uh, talk about. Um, but however, if you're in a solid where things are already held fairly close together, um, and then maybe if you pack in even further hydrogen, I mean, this is what people do, right? With like heavy metals, they pack in more hydrogen or deuterium and their thought is that now you have you're holding the deuterium or hydrogen very close together within your lattice and then there's also free electrons around that further shield your coulomb potential and the question is here does our understanding of nuclear fusion developed with two body high energy collisions is that picture actually applicable to in a low energy condensed matter environment. Fascinating. Um, and so the, there's already evidence that, you know, the cross sections are indeed different just purely from the electron screening itself. So why aren't we testing this out more? It seems like it wouldn't be that expensive, especially since everything's operating, I guess operating at room temperature or do you have to get things even cooler? No, uh, people can do this at room temperature or, or maybe slightly higher. Like, why isn't there just a lab where we're taking all sorts of lattice structures and then doping it, you know, with the appropriate, you know, deuteriums and doing all sorts of funny things to it, changing the pressure a little bit, changing, maybe putting electric current through it a little bit, yep. maybe spinning, I don't know. Let's well, so there are people doing this type of thing, um, but there, you know, there's a big stigma against that, right? Why, be, be, why is there a big stigma? Because of what happened, uh, you know, back in 89 with Fleischmann and Pons. And, because a couple people lied about their work. Yeah, and even that's uh, not a straightforward story, right? <laughs> but. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of a recent uh, study that Google sponsored. No, tell me about it. The, um, it was published a perspective in, in Nature. So they came at this like, okay, we just we want to do careful, rigorous scientific measurements of loading hydrogen into palladium samples, of doing very careful calorimetry, because people use calorimetry to claim that, oh, we saw excess heat or something, right? Mm. Or, and also to try to do careful experiments that really measure that fusion cross-section at low energies. I should say, be below a few keV of energy, there's just very sparse data on the fusion cross-section, whether it's in condensed matter or not. Yeah, It's because the cross-section gets so small <laughs> that it's hard to get meaningful signal. 
And so there's actually just a big error bar uh, once you get below a few keV. And um, EV is what at normal room temperature things are normally moving around at. So keV is a, like let's say a thousand times more than that. So anything less than a thousand times more than that, which is the reality that we operate in. That's every right. Day. Right. I mean, even one EV is already like eleven thousand Kelvin. Right. One EV is eleven thousand <laughs> Kelvin. Wow. Yeah. Um, okay, so we don't have an update on this. Uh, you so said they're trying to. Yeah, so the Google study kind of just said, let's bring in really good academic scientists um, and let them do some careful work. And that's what this article uh, reported on um, after about two or three years of work. What was the result? Well, so they did not find evidence of, of any anom anomalies so far, but they believe that now they've developed the tools well enough that they should, like you said, right? Why isn't anybody out there carefully, you know, changing pressures, trying samples, making careful measurements? Well, I think what the Google study was trying to do was get a team of really good scientists together and, and getting them to the point where they can do that. Yeah. No, that'd be amazing because even if, um, you're not discovering anything initially, but like you said, you're getting the tools and the processes in place. Then all of a sudden, as long as you're you know, very diligent about how you collect the data, now you've got a database to pull from. Now you can probably open up this database to the world, and now you've got the world's worth of intellectual potential that can look at some of the results and say, oh, maybe I can try to do some predictive work. Yes. And then once they're doing some predictive work, now you can better allocate the resources at these labs and focus them on different materials, different things to test, and your data keeps getting better. And it becomes this iterative process where at least a discovery, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> I, I, th I think just given the tremendous um, upside there that that we owe it to ourselves to figure out if this really is quackery or if there's something in there. I agree. And and that's one of the things that I like um, about RPE too. I always thought RPE was a super special program um, because of what you just mentioned there. Um, high risk, high reward. Right. I mean, so my, my previous world, you know, startup founder, you know, venture capitalist, that's their business model. They invest in 10 businesses, not only knowing that nine of them will fail, mm -hmm. hoping that nine of them will fail, because that means that they're not being too conservative, right. and that allows for that one that doesn't fail to take over entire markets. Right. And the analogy here is that if you apply that same high risk, high reward mentality, um, by you know by uh, eagerly investing in a whole host of things that might fail, not feeling bad when they do, yeah. what you're not doing is artificially capping your potential for when right. you do make that discovery. Right. That's what I love about RPE. Yeah, yeah, I feel that tension myself, right? There's always this this pressure to to not go too far out there. I mean, I think the, the, the other beauty of RPE is we also insist on, on really good, credible science basis, right? It's okay if we don't understand it yet, but we do still apply a scientific rigor to our evaluation. Yeah. So in the same way that I was talking about cold fusion, right, there has to be a scientific basis for what you're doing. Yeah. And not just kind of randomly shooting darts at a board. Yeah. It's, what you were talking about, is there another uh, um, word for it? I keep seeing this thing pop up occasionally. L-E-N-E-R. L-E-N-R. L-E-N-R. Is that the same thing that we're talking about? Low energy different? nuclear reaction. I think, I think to the world at large, they may as well be the same thing. It just basically is like, you know, can we have nuclear reactions at chemical relevant energies, right? Can you can you access nuclear binding energies, which are typically MEV, with only EV level energy inputs? So I think both cold fusion and LENR are, are, are after that general um, goal, right? Yeah. But I think maybe if you want to start splitting hairs, cold fusion is really about fusion at low energies, whereas mm -hmm. LENR is a little broader. It could be other nuclear transmutations or 
neutron capture processes. It doesn't necessarily have to be fusion per se. Or like even like um, cascading effects of what might happen within an atom as you apply a little something here and energy transforms and bounces out a little bit different. Yeah, ways. just just changing you know one element to another um, through alchemy. through yeah <laughs> exactly it it really is it's it's real alchemy right I know, it's nuclear amazing. transmutation you know? It, you know it's, it's so funny I I did an interview um, God this must must have been a year and a half ago I flew out to CERN and got to meet with some of their uh, top physicists out there. Uh, Michael Dozer was one of them. He's a, a world expert in antimatter. And I got to spend the whole day with him. And sometimes it takes a whole day to get comfortable with someone and not to like, ask them the crazy questions. And I asked him, I was like, what is the chance that like all of our theory um, about everything, you know, quarks uh -huh. and, and stars and everything, I was like, what, what's the chance that it's just all wrong? <laughs> Um, and by this time we'd spend enough each other with the, you know, enough time with each other that he looks at me and he says, he pauses for a while, very dramatic. And he goes, it's definitely all wrong, but this is just the best model that we have to represent you know, the universe right now. But that stuck with me. It's definitely wrong. And the way I interpreted that is that there's so much about physics itself that we have left to understand mm -hmm. and to explore. And I mean, humanity has never had, you know, um, greater access to our intellectual potential, right? Now that we've got more people who are educated, you know, we've got a larger population. We have um, people around the world that don't need to be farmers. It's like never before have we had a greater opportunity to unlock a better understanding of the universe and then uh, utilize it uh, to create the world that we want. And I feel like we're just so close and we're like building the keys and we're finding the doors and, our entire understanding of the way that things work may very well change. And maybe we will be able to unlock a future where energy uh, and energy really is prosperity is just abundant and no. infinite and accessible to us. Right. And when we know, we know many of these things work right in a star, yeah. uh, we know they work. It's a matter of harnessing it here on earth in an economic way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so simply put. Okay. So Scott, as we wrap up here today, you know, Maybe just leave us on a note as to why all this is important and you know, where you see all this going in the next 10 years. You mean fusion particularly? or Yeah, yeah. yeah no, good, that, that's great. It's very timely. Um, <clears throat> I, th I, think, I think fusion does have an opportunity right now. Um, there's a spread of opinions. You know, on the one end, it's like, we just have to demonstrate technical feasibility at all costs because we don't know if it's possible yet. And that's a true statement. And then there's the side of, well, unless we make it commercially economic and attractive, then all of this is for naught anyway. And that's a true statement too, right? And so I think the opportunity right now is really for us as a country and even us as a world to decide, well, how urgent and how bold do we want to be to find that the proper spot in that spectrum, right? Because right now all the world programs are kind of here. Let's throw huge money at demonstrating technical feasibility. We're not really paying much attention to the commercial viability of it. And then you have the private companies that are like starting from here. They know they have to have a business that makes money and they're coming at it from this side and on in many cases they're so far from technical feasibility that you know th these guys don't pay much attention to them, right? That's starting to change. But I think I came to ARPA-E um, mainly to, to accelerate the meeting of the minds of these two ends, right? Because I think one or the other is not gonna, not gonna make fusion have impact anytime soon. But if we can find the right meeting of the minds, then fusion I think can have impact in a time scale that matters, you know, for our problems this century. Scott Chu, thank you so much. Thank you, Brett. <laughs>